The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, in the 36th chapter, and verses 29 and 30. Verses 29 and 30. In the 36th chapter of the book of the prophet Ezekiel, I will also save you from all your uncleannesses, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses, and I will call for the corn and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Now the word also at the beginning of that uh, 29th verse reminds us that we are continuing a theme, a theme that has engaged us now for quite a number of Sunday evenings. It is uh, the theme that is unfolded in this uh, 36th chapter of this uh, book of the prophet Ezekiel uh, from verse 16 to the end of the chapter. It's one of those marvelous uh, portrayals uh, of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which are to be found scattered about so freely in the pages of the Old Testament. I trust that that remark uh, does not come as a surprise to anybody. If you've got New Testament eyes, you'll find the gospel in the Old Testament, everywhere practically. There are these prophecies of it, these foreshadowings, these adumbrations. And here we've got a very typical one, and a very perfect one as we've been seeing, and a very comprehensive one. Now that is not the only meaning of this portion of scripture. It had an immediate message for the children of Israel uh, to whom it was first delivered. It has undoubtedly something to say also uh, to the children of Israel today. It may have something to say with respect to their future, but whether it has or not, there is nothing which is quite so clear as this, as we have already seen from many quotations from the New Testament, that it is one of those foreshadowings of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and of its glorious and wonderful benefits. Now, I've been emphasizing Sunday by Sunday the importance of the steps and the stages. I'm not doing this, I'm simply repeating what the prophet says. There is this and or this also all along. Whether we like it or not, there is a plan in redemption, there is a plan in salvation. It's God's plan and he works it in a very definite manner. And we've got to take the steps as they come. This, of course, is characteristic of God's work everywhere. There is nothing that God ever does but that it's done according to some sort of plan. I've no doubt we sometimes have felt that it's very annoying that uh, you have to sow the seed in the ground and bury it out of sight and have to wait weeks before you even begin to discover that it's still alive, and then have to wait many months before you can take of the fruit. We'd like, of course, to plant one day and to eat the fruit the next, but that isn't God's way. He's got a definite order, a definite plan, and a definite arrangement. It's seen in all his works. Men cleverly talk about the laws of nature, as if they'd put them there. But all that man does is to discover what God has put into nature. And we are able to talk about the laws of nature and to make our discoveries and to produce our inventions for one reason only, and that is that God always works upon a plan. He starts at a given point, then he does the next thing, and then the third, and then the fourth. And he always keeps to his own plan and arrangement. If he didn't, None of our inventions would be possible. The whole basis of scientific invention is just this, that you can rely upon what is called nature to keep on doing the same thing in the same order. 
Well, in other words, you can rely upon God always to do the same thing in the same way. Well, now that is something that is not only obvious in the realm of nature and in creation, it is particularly clear when you come to this realm of God's dealings with men and God's method of delivering men from sin and its consequences and giving unto him his great salvation. So we've got to accept the order, as it must always be spring, summer, autumn, winter. So it is always this. First of all, forgiveness of sins. Let me make this perfectly clear. God will do nothing for you or for me or for anybody else until the question of our guilt has been dealt with. Ah, oh, but you say, I don't like that doctrine of sin. I'm not interested in guilt. What I want is some help from God to live my life. My dear friend, you will never get it until the question of your guilt has been dealt with. We all want health, don't we? We don't like operations, but we want health. Sometimes you can't have health without an operation. You can't have it without a lot of pain and suffering. That's the order. And God always starts, as he does here in the 25th verse, with sprinkling clean water upon us and cleansing us from our filthiness and from all our idols. There is no relationship with God at all, except our sins and our guilt have been dealt with. So he always starts with that, as he does here. In other words, this is the foundation, the basis, Jesus Christ and him crucified. There are people who tell you that you can get many benefits from God and they don't mention Jesus Christ, still less him crucified. Oh, I trust that I'm putting it plainly and simply when I say this, that it's a lie. It's a lie. It isn't true. You can have psychological experiences, but if you want an experience of salvation and of God, you must come by God's way. And God's way is that he sent his only begotten son into this world. And not only that, but he sent him to the cross to bear our sins and their punishment. He died that we might be forgiven. And there is no knowledge of God and no blessing from God except that way. Very well, it starts there. And then you notice he goes on to regeneration. He goes on to the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we saw last Sunday night, it all leads up to this. To bring us to God. I said last Sunday evening in considering verse 28 that it is the supreme blessing. I repeat it tonight. Here it is, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, but here is the blessing. Ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. There's nothing beyond that. There never can be anything beyond that. The supreme blessing is to come into that relationship with God in which you can say, my God. My God, thou art mine, and I am thine. Now, all that God has done in Jesus Christ and all the application of it by the Holy Spirit is designed just to bring us to that, to fit us for that, to prepare us for that. But you notice that the prophet doesn't stop having said that. Having brought us to that topmost point, he now goes on. Well, what's he going to show us now? Well, now he's going to show us some of the things that result from that. You see how simple this gospel is. Man's real need is just to know God. And if once he knows God, all his other subsidiary needs will be dealt with and will be satisfied. So, that, therefore, the order must always be this. Uh, the children of Israel had been in a state of famine. They didn't like famine. They wanted plenty. And their great cry was for plenty. Yes, but you can't have plenty except from God. 
So you see, the great thing is to know how to come to God. And it's exactly the same still this evening. The world is in trouble. It's aware of certain particular needs, yes, but its tragedy is that it doesn't know the cause of all this. And that is its need of God. So if we are interested in particular blessings, the thing to do is to discover how to arrive at God and to know that he is our God and we are his people. Very well, that is the way through Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Christ who has borne our punishment and died in our stead and has reconciled us to God and who then gives us new life and the power of the Holy Spirit and who brings us into the presence of God, washed and cleansed and reconciled and renewed. Now then, having done that, I say, now we can begin to discuss and to consider the particular blessings. And here they are put for us in these two verses that we are considering tonight. Now, you notice that this prophet puts them in terms of material blessings. He talks about... Uh, calling for the corn and increasing it so that there may be no famine. He will multiply also the fruit of the trees and the increase of the field. Now, this is an important and a very interesting principle. Blessings from God in the Old Testament generally are put in that material form and manner. God, if I may so put it with reverence, spoke to the people in a manner that they could understand. So you will find that God's blessings in the Old Testament are generally in terms of some sort of material blessing. A great crop of corn, fruit trees full of fruit, a great abundance of sheep and of cattle and of oxen and of camels and so on. That's the way in which men estimated their blessing at the hand of God. It was God's way, I say, of accommodating himself to the ignorance and the frailty of the people. But let us remember that all that, in addition to being true under the Old Testament dispensation, was also a foreshadowing of a very much higher type of blessing that was going to come. The spiritual blessings of salvation that come in and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that as you read your Old Testament and read about all the corn and the fruit and the fruit of the vine and so on and so forth, that is just this pictorial way of representing these mighty, glorious, wonderful spiritual blessings that God offers to all who believe in his only Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Very well. What is the result of salvation? What is it that I can look forward to, having come to God in and through the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me summarize it by putting it like this. I come to a place of fullness of blessing. I come to a place of all sufficiency. I come to a place of final satisfaction. The salvation which is obtainable in the Lord Jesus Christ is a full and an abounding and a gloriously abundant salvation. And that there is literally no end to the blessings that it has to offer to us. Now, I venture to suggest to you that there is no aspect of the Christian life that is so missed as just that. There is no aspect of the Christian life that is quite so frequently misunderstood as that. You ask the average person tonight why he or she is not a Christian, and I think you'll find that probably they'll say something like this to you. Christianity, they say. Most certainly not. Why, will you say? Well, they say it's so narrow. It's such a small life, it's such a cramped life, it's such a miserable life, it's such an uninteresting life. Their idea of Christianity is that it's a life which calls you to give up things and gives you nothing in return. To use the words of Milton, it's a life which calls you to scorn delights and live laborious days. 
miserable, narrow, cramped, cabined, and confined. Taking away on all hands and giving nothing in return. Now, they say this about the Christian life in every respect. They say no self-respecting man intellectually can possibly be a Christian. They say Christianity confines you to one book and you shut out everything else. It has nothing to give you intellectually, they say. You just become a fool. You just become an ignoramus. They say that this sort of thing flourishes amongst ignorant, illiterate people and has nothing to give to the sophisticated, to the cultured. Intellectually, they say, it's nowhere. It's got nothing. It just makes you say goodbye to intellect and jettison your intellect. They say exactly the same thing about it in the realm of feelings and of emotion. The world is interested, it tells us, in love. In the exercise of emotions. And it feels that this is so miserable, so sad, so drab, so dull and so uninteresting. And then they say, for the imagination, what's it got to give? When you go to the world, why? Your imagination is always being stimulated. You get it in your poetry, you get it in your films, you get it in your plays, you get it in your novels. Always new horizons opened out, the realm of the imagination. There's no end to it, how wonderful it is. Nothing like that, they say in Christianity, the same old thing. Held down, kept in, cramped, confined. Or to sum it up, they have a feeling that this Christian life is a very negative sort of life. And that there's nothing large and bounding and full about this, but really quite the reverse, nothing positive, that it's an entirely negative life. Well, now, I say that most people reject Christianity for that reason. I could give you factual evidence to prove what I'm saying. There are people who reject it themselves because of that. There are people who become very concerned that certain persons who are very dear to them and whom they love very much become Christians. They feel, but they're just shutting themselves out from life, they say. They're going to live a small little life. They're going to miss so much. And they're concerned about them that they're entering into this narrow little realm. Indeed, most people today seem to reject Christianity in terms of what they call life. It's because they want life, they say, and a full life, a great life, that they have no use for this Christian life. But you notice that our text tonight says the exact opposite. The text tonight seems to suggest that it's the other life that is the life of famine, the life of need, the life of want, and that this is a life of riches and of blessing and of superabundance. And therefore it behoves me to establish this point and to demonstrate it. I therefore would put to you as my first principle just this. The sinful life, the godless life, the life that is independent of God and doesn't look to him, is a life that always and invariably leads to famine. Here it is like this, listen to it. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses and I will call for the corn and will increase it and will lay no famine upon you. They had the head of famine, they'd been in a state of famine. And then he goes on to say, and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field. Why? That ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. You see, this is what had happened. The children of Israel, because of their disobedience of God, had been in a state of famine. And all the heathen nations that looked at them and said, Oh, there are people who said they were God's people. Look at them, they're starving. They're in a state of famine. They've been in a state of famine. God says, No longer shall you be in a state of famine when I've done all this to you. I will shower my blessings upon you. Very well, then I lay down as a proposition that it is the sinful life that always leads to famine. 
I needn't keep you with this because our Lord has stated it all very perfectly for us once and forever. In the parable of the prodigal son, who left home with his pockets full of money but found himself in a land which was visited by famine, and a great famine arose in that land, the far-off land to which he'd gone, the land he'd said was so much better than his homeland, the land for which he'd forsaken father and brother and home and everything else, this marvelous land that he'd heard of. Off he went. A great famine arose in that land, and he began to be in want. And eventually he reached the point of starvation, famine. Oh, there it is, I say, once and forever. How often did it happen to the children of Israel themselves? It was their disobedience of God, their violating of his laws, that ever always rendered them into this condition of famine. And my dear friends, is there anything more obvious in this modern world of ours than the appalling famine of the days in which we live. Of course, I'm not talking in terms of food or material things. I'm lifting this, as I said just now, into the realm of the spiritual. You know, everybody's talking about the atomic bomb and uh, the hydrogen bomb and all these other things. There's something much more appalling than all that. That's the spiritual famine in which men and women are living. The appalling famine and starvation of life apart from God. Let me show you what I mean. This famine, I say, of those who are not in communion with God is quite inevitable. It's inevitable for this reason. The very type of life which they live leads to famine. It leads to famine in some part of men of necessity. If the Bible is right when it says, and it is, that man was made by God and for God, well, obviously, man without God must be in need. He must be in a state in which he's deprived of that which is most valuable. He's in a state of famine. He's in a state of starvation, by definition. If man was made for certain things and he is not interested in those things, oh, how poor he is, how deprived he is, how starved he is. And the whole case of the Bible is just to say that any man who is not in communion with God and being blessed by God is in a state of spiritual starvation by definition of necessity. But you notice that there's a second thing which makes this inevitable, and it's this. That God finally withholds his blessings from those who don't seek him. That's exactly what he did with the children of Israel. They said they could get on without God. They began worshipping other gods. Very well, said God. Carry on. And he withheld his blessings. And there they are starving in a state of famine. He withheld his blessings. And the most appalling thing that can happen ever to a human being is to be abandoned by God. Oh, there's an awful word in the book of the prophet Hosea where God says this about Ephraim. Ephraim rejoices in his sin. Let him alone. Leave him to himself. Abandoned of God. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it in the first chapter of his epistle to the Romans, when mankind in its folly and its ignorance and sin gets to a certain point, God gave them up. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. He just withdrew his blessings and his control. And that's what's happening in the modern world. God is leaving men to themselves. They've said they don't want him. Very well, says God, get on without me. That is why famine is inevitable. But let me try to show you some of the elements of this famine, some of its characteristics. 
Let us look at it in practice, in operation. I say that life without God is a starved life. It's a life of famine. And I mean that, first of all, with respect to the mind and the intellect. Surely, says someone, you're not going to say that this present generation is a generation that is starved in the realm of mind and of intellect? Well, as I read the newspapers and the reports that they give of uh, what is being said by librarians when they meet in conference, I'm beginning to think this is true. The librarians tell us that people uh, are no longer anxious to read. They don't go for books as they used to. They're not even reading novels. They say they can't read. The mind doesn't seem to be capable of it. There was a time, you know, when people could listen to speeches and addresses and lectures and sermons, which might go on for an hour or longer. We are told today that the modern man can't stand it. He can't take it in. We are told that he can't concentrate for more than 20 minutes. I'm not saying all this. It's the newspapers. It's the authorities. So you've got to break it up and have pauses and a little music to give relief. The mind of man can't stand the strain. Well, all right, there are the facts. It seems to me that the mind of men is being starved, isn't it? What's the matter? Why is men's mind like this? Why can't it take in truth? Why has everything got to be spoon-fed today? Why has it got to be so simple and so elementary? Why can't people follow argument and reason and logic? They could, you know, a hundred years ago, and they reveled in it, and they delighted in it. Read the speeches of the statesmen, read the sermons of the preachers. They rejoiced in all this. But man today says, it isn't so much that I don't like it, I can't do it. What's the matter? Doesn't it look as if the human intellect is being starved? Ah, when man turns away from God... His mind always begins to degenerate. I could prove it to you historically, time without number. Did you know this, my friends, that it is when this country has been most religious, it has been most intellectual? That's a simple fact. Our popular modern education is a direct outcome of the evangelical revival of 200 years ago. There was a similar thing after the Protestant Reformation. The same thing happened in the Puritan revival of the 17th century. When men come to God, their very minds begin to open out when they go away from God. Well, they stop using their minds. And you see, that's what's happening today. They say they can't read and they can't listen to sermons. They can only look at pictures. They can only look at the television. They can only work out football pools. Is that intellectual? Now, if a man tells me that he doesn't like Christianity, I say, all right, you're entitled to say that. I say, but let me have your reasons. And the first reason he gives is this, it cramps my intellect. And he proves to me the size of his intellect by spending his weekend, instead of reading the Bible and listening to sermons and reason statements, working out football pools, trying to guess. Very well, I hope that you realize that you may be laughing at yourself. What I'm establishing is that the godless life starves the mind. And that whatever else goes when men turn from God, true intellectual life and activity disappears. In the same way exactly it starves the moral nature. You know, there are people in the world today who just don't know what morality means. I'm not condemning them. I'm sorry for them. They just don't know what morality means. It's because they're godless. It's because they're out of touch with God. They see no wrong in what they're doing. They misuse their bodies. They abuse them. They're guilty of foul perversions. They see no wrong in it. They're quite honest. They're sincere. I'm not saying they're not sincere. I grant you their absolute sincerity. What's the matter with them? Well, they are what we call today 
amoral, not immoral, but amoral. You see, the immoral man knows he's wrong. He knew he was wrong. He had a sense of morals. The trouble today is that people haven't even a sense of morals. It means nothing to them. They haven't a moral nature almost. It's starved. You're reading the newspapers and you're seeing it there. This godless life starves the moral nature of men. And it's evident, you see, not only purely in the matters of the flesh, physical matters, Moral judgment in the political world is going. It's going internationally. Convenience. Anything that happens to suit. We drop our principles. We'll change our coats. We'll do anything in order to have an easy and a good time. Compromise is the rule of the day and the old standards of God. Things have been tolerated in this century that they wouldn't have dreamt of tolerating a hundred years ago. What a decline in the realm of morals is to be seen in politics and in every other realm of life. And finally, the heart is starved. This is one of the real tragedies of this present age which talks so much about the heart and is so interested in the emotion and in love. Oh, as I read these newspapers and see what's happening, do you know what I feel? I say to myself, the real trouble with these people is they don't know what love is. They don't. They're just fascinated for a moment. It's some infatuation. The poor things, if they only knew what it was to be in love, they wouldn't behave like this. They wouldn't be passing like this in series through the divorce courts and so on. No. I'm not condemning them. I'm sorry for them. I'm trying to show you that they're just starved emotionally. They don't know what love is. Their emotional nature has been so deprived and neglected and starved that they don't begin to understand these things. Oh, all along the line and in every department, the godless life leads, I say, to starvation. If it's like that, as you analyze it well, when you put circumstances into it, you see it still more clearly. It's when things go wrong that you see the state of starvation that people are in. Nothing to turn to. No one to go to. No consolation to fall back upon. Nothing to assuage the grief. Nothing to give some compensation. So they fly to drink or drugs. They've got to. They can't stand it. They'd break down. They're kept going by drugs in various ways. Is there anything that so proves the utter appalling starvation and famine of men in a spiritual sense? So much as the way in which they're entirely dependent upon artificial stimulants of various types and kinds. And when they come finally to look at death and the end, they have nothing at all without hope. Will nothing at all to speak to them, to their minds, their hearts, their moral nature. Nothing behind them, nothing in the moment, nothing to look forward to. A blank. It is the godless life that leads to starvation. Oh, there's a beautiful word in the New Testament that sums it all up. We are told that our blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ looked at the people who were milling round and about him and that he was grieved in so and sorry in heart because he saw them as what? As sheep without a shepherd. He didn't condemn them. He felt a heart of compassion. He felt sorrow for them. He came from heaven because of them. As sheep without a shepherd. There is a great abundance of grass, but the sheep don't know it. And they haven't got a shepherd to lead them to it. They're dashing about trying to find a blade here and there. They're living in a wilderness. Sheep without a shepherd. Oh, how terrible, how sad. His heart was full of compassion for them as he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And that's the modern world. 
And that is why the heart of every Christian should be full of compassion for men and women who think that they're living a marvelous life, but who are revealing the fact that they're living in a state of starvation with their hectic cheeks and their overstimulated eyes and their nerves on end and the breakdowns and all the things that follow. It's the sinful life that leads to famine and starvation. It is the Christian life that leads to blessing and satisfaction and superabundance. I will call for the corn and will increase it. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field. And blessed be the name of God he does. You know the men of the Old Testament knew something about this. We've already dealt with it twice this evening in the service. We sang together that metrical version of the 23rd Psalm. Listen, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What a contrast. He leadeth me beside the still waters into the green pastures. He restoreth my soul. He prepares a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. David was a man who knew what he was talking about. David had, to use the modern language, he'd had a shot at both types of life. And that's what he said. And he said it again in that 84th Psalm. As a man, he said, who's got a bit of experience in this world, I tell you, I would sooner be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the ungodly. Fancy a man like that. He'd prefer to stand and be the doorkeeper, giving out hymn books in the vestibule, rather than to be in the very center of the life of the ungodly. Why? Well, he knows that that life of the ungodly, though it appears to be wonderful at first, is just a life that robs you. It takes from you. It exhausts you. And it leaves you as a wreck at the end. That's what you get in the tents of the ungodly. Exhaustion, emaciation, and final hopelessness. But the very threshold of God's house, the very vestibule, is a rather wonderful place, he says. I can peep in through the door sometimes and look in and have a glimpse at the glory. The Lord God is a sun and a shield, grace and glory. Just a glimpse of it. Oh, how marvelous. A day, a day in thy courts, he says, is better than a thousand. What a satisfaction this life gives. Well, if you want to see it all again in detail, read the 11th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, and there you'll be given a sort of analysis of the life of those Old Testament saints and heroes. You can sum it all up, you like, if you like, in the words that we are told about Moses. He chose, rather, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He had his eye on the recompense of the reward. Oh, but this New Testament is full of it. Listen to our Lord himself saying it unto the woman of Samaria. Whosoever, he says to the woman of Samaria, shall drink of this water, the water in the physical well, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What an abundance. Or listen to him saying it again in the sixth chapter of that same gospel according to St. John in verse 35. He that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Famine, narrow, cramped, depriving, not at all. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. He says it again in the 10th chapter of that Gospel of John. He talks about his sheep. 
And what he says about them is this. They shall go in and out and find pasture. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Narrow, cramped, confined, you say, taking from you, miserable, wretched. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Is it true? Well, ask the Apostle Paul. And you remember the answer that he's already given us? We read it in that fourth chapter of the epistle to the Philippians. It's all there for us, but let me hurriedly put it again into the same divisions for you, into the same compartments. Is this true in practice? Well, I say it is true. And if it were not true, I wouldn't be standing in this pulpit at this moment. I rejoice to say this. If I had no other reason for being a Christian than this, it would be enough for me. The sheer intellectual satisfaction that it gives me. I know of nothing that is comparable to this book. Why, some of us have been meeting here on Sunday mornings. We spend 38 Sunday mornings on the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians alone. I don't know how many we've spent on the second chapter. We are in the 30s. It's somewhere about 33 already. One chapter. What's it mean? Well, it just means this, that its content is so terrific that it takes us all that time to get at it, and even now I feel we are not touching it. Intellectual satisfaction. As I look here at God's plan of making the world his purpose with respect to it, as I see the fall coming in and apparently wrecking it, and then God initiating that other movement, I'm interested in history. I'm a student of history in my little way. I'm a little bit of a student of philosophy. I'm interested in men. I'm interested in the working of man's mind and brain. I'm interested in this world and what's happening in it. I'm interested in politics and all these things. I'm interested in men tremendously. And it's because of that I'm a Christian. Because it's only here I find a satisfactory answer to my questions. It's only here I find a philosophy that really holds water. It's only here that I begin to understand history and what's happening. I've tried the others, I still read them, but they give me nothing. They raise questions, they're brilliant at putting questions. But I'm more interested in answers than in questions. And for my answers, I always have to come to this book. My dear friend, if you're not a Christian, believe me, your mind hasn't started working yet. That's your real trouble. The content is too small. The pabulum is not sufficient. The spoke, the plan, is not big enough. You're living in a little section. We are all experts today on some little branch of knowledge. Come, I say, and have the whole philosophy of God. You've got it in this book. Begin to study it and apply your mind to it. You'll be amazed at the results that will follow. Your mind will begin to develop and to expand. You'll take in and encompass various realms. You'll be amazed at yourself. Intellectual satisfaction. I confess that one of my great problems in life is to find sufficient time to read this book and to read the books and the works of men who've written about it. If I hadn't got a conscience and were not a little bit concerned about other men and women whom I know are dying in sin and whom I see as sheep without a shepherd, if I were not governed by that, I'd shut myself up in libraries and spend the rest of my days just reading, reading the Puritans, reading about Wesley and Whitfield and the men of the 18th century, grappling with these tremendous commentaries on this final truth. And even then I die and feel that I hadn't started. Oh, my dear friends, you've no idea how you're starving your minds and your brains and your intellects if you're not Christian. 
And obviously it does the same for one's moral nature. Here it is in our 29th verse, I will also save you from all your uncleannesses. You see, though you're a Christian, though you believe Christ has died for you, though you're born again, and though the Holy Spirit is in you, you will still find uncleannesses in you. And you'll be worried and troubled about it. And you'll be unhappy about it. And you'll say, oh, how can I get rid of these? And you'll only find the answer in this same marvelous gospel of salvation. It is by that power of the Holy Spirit that we've already been dealing with on a previous Sunday evening. It is in that way alone, the Spirit working in you mightily, that you'll be delivered from your uncleannesses, your particular sins. The moral nature, how it develops and expands, how a man has a new idea about life and living, how looking into the face of Christ and reading his life, you see what men should be, how one should walk through this vile world, and you want to be like him, and you go on and you follow him. And your moral nature begins to develop and to expand. And you grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. And, of course, your emotional nature. Oh, if only men and women knew something about this. If you only knew something about the joy of salvation. Oh, I understand the psalmist very well. A day in thy courts is better than a thousand. You know, I'd give up a lifetime almost for certain blessed experiences that God in his mercy has vouchsafed me. Emotion. Do you know what it is to be moved to the very depth of your being? Wordsworth, in a mystical sense, was able to say, you remember to me the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. Oh, but if he'd known something about this, he'd have known something altogether deeper and bigger and mightier than that. The joy, the peace, the satisfaction, the emotional content. Read your hymns. Look at those men. Were they simply indulging in fancy? No, no. They'd experienced it. They were enjoying these things. That's why they wrote their experiences in their hymns. Thou art, O Christ, that all I want, says Charles Wesley. More than all in thee I find. Plenteous grace in thee is found. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Love, joy, peace, and all these other glorious emotions. But of course you see it most of all, and this is the final proof, when you're face to face with circumstances. I've already quoted our Lord's words to you. He was a realist, he knew what it was to suffer. But he did say, you remember, he that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. You know, that is the literal truth. It doesn't matter what's happening. If you go to Christ, you'll no longer hunger, you'll no longer thirst. Whatever your need is, whatever your lack, whatever your lack of satisfaction, go to Christ and I assure you, I'll guarantee you, you'll no longer be hungry, you'll no longer thirst. He will more than satisfy you. Or are you facing trials and tribulations and adversities? Are you almost hemmed in round and about by problems and by difficulties? Well, this is what the Apostle Paul says unto you, and he was speaking directly out of a life of great hardships and sufferings. In nothing be anxious. In nothing allow yourself to be killed by anxious care and to be crushed by anxiety. In nothing be anxious. But in all things, it doesn't matter what, put in anything you like, in all things, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You'll be amazed at yourself. 
You'll be astonished when you wake up in the morning that you could possibly have slept with such terrible problems confronting you, but you will. The peace of God that passeth all understanding will keep your hearts and minds. It'll act as a garrison round them so that as the anxious thoughts come, they'll be shut out. And your heart and your mind will enjoy that blessed peace and rest. Oh, listen to him as he goes on. I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therein to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. He's independent of circumstances. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He never fails. There it is in circumstances. What about death? Well... We've already been putting it in that hymn, haven't we? The blessed hope. Death, the last enemy, the final problem, not to the Christian. To me, says Paul, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For it means going to be with Christ, which is far better. My hope I cannot measure. My path to life is free. My Savior has my treasure. And he will walk with me. Oh, the abounding character of this blessed life in Christ. Oh, the glory of it all. Yes, the corn is abounding. The fruit tree is laden with fruit. The earth is giving her increase. My every need is satisfied. My intellect, my heart, my moral nature. Whatever circumstance or chance may bring, it's all right. I'm given a new way of looking at them. I'm given a new understanding. I'm given a philosophy that can see through it. Death, the end, everything, I see through it all. And I look to eternity, where there is reserved for all who are in Christ an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved by God in heaven for all who are in Christ. Beloved friend, shall I ask you a simple question? Are you enjoying this richness, this blessing? Are you aware of this satisfaction in Christ? Do you know the peace of God that passes all understanding when everything has gone against you? Can you say that you never hunger and never thirst? What of your intellectual life? What of your moral life? What of your emotional life? Are you being satisfied? How are you standing up to life? If you fail, if you are failing, you know there's only one explanation. It's this. You don't know God. For if you know God, if God is your God, and you are God's child, you will know the satisfaction. So if you haven't got the satisfaction, it is simply because you don't know God. And why don't you know God? Well, it may be that you've never realized you're a sinner. It may be that you've never seen any meaning or sense in bread and wine, that you see no purpose in the death of Christ upon the cross and the shedding of his blood. That's the trouble. You've got to go right back to the first step. For once you know God, you will know satisfaction. So if you don't know the satisfaction, you start by simply going to God and confessing your sin. You ask him by his spirit to make you realize your sin as you've never done before. You ask him to give you the new nature and the new life. You ask him to give you his spirit in his fullness. And if you do so genuinely, he will answer you. And you will begin to know 
this blessed life of God. Oh, my dear friend, if you have felt in this service that like the prodigal you are in some strange, far-off land where there is nothing but famine and that you are bereft and starving in the vitals of your being, hasten this evening to Jesus Christ who is waiting and willing and ready to receive you and who will lead you to God and introduce you to the abundance, the life which is life indeed, the life which is more abundant that he has to give. Hasten to him. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.